Today I'm going to talk to you about definite integrals. And before we talk about that, we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. So after all these years, months, whatever, of doing calculus, you're finally learning the fundamental theorem. Isn't that great? So what it says is that if a function is continuous on the interval a, b, then the definite integral, it's definite now because it has boundaries. So from a to b of the function with respect to x is the antiderivative evaluated at b minus the antiderivative evaluated at a, where f is any antiderivative of f. Now you might say, okay, what do they mean any antiderivative? Well, remember when we took the antiderivative and we had to say plus c? Well, if you are taking the antiderivative, and if I put this plus c and this f at a plus c, but I'm subtracting this, you can see that the c's are going to cancel out anyway. So it's not important that you add that into your calculation because it's just going to be plus c minus c, so no c. Okay, so let's look at a few of the rules. They're very straightforward and easy to understand, I believe. It says that if you have a definite integral evaluated between a and b of f at x dx, that's equal to the negative of the integral from a to b. So a to b or b to a. So if I do it backwards, in other words, when I go to evaluate this, I would do f at b minus f at a. And this time I'm doing f at a minus f at b. So you can see if I had, um, if this was 5 and this was 1, I would have 5 minus 1 would give me 4. And if I had 1 and 5 here, 1 minus 5 would be minus 4. So the minus of that is equal to this one. That's all that one says. Example 2 here says, if I have a definite integral that has the same boundary, so a to a, that means the area is going to be 0. Because basically you're talking about the area under a point, so a straight line basically. There's no area to it, so that's why it says that the area is equal to 0. Now, if I have a definite integral from a to b of f at x dx and from b to c of f at x dx, that's the same as evaluating it from a to c. In other words, all you're doing is you're just adding the two areas together, so you might as well evaluate them all at once. Now, if you have a constant times a function and you're taking the definite integral of that, that c is actually with this part here, then I can take the constant out front and evaluate the integral between a and b. Pretty basic, right? And similarly, if I have something like f at x dx plus g at x dx, I can evaluate them separately and add them together. Now also, if my integral, my function, is above the x-axis, then this area is going to be greater than 0. But if my function is underneath the x-axis, then this area is going to be negative. Now, if I had a function where I'm going between a and b, and some of it has area above and some of it is below, and in, for instance, if I had the function cos x, and I evaluated the area between here and here, so let's say between 0 and 2 pi. If I evaluate that, then I'm going to end up with an area of 0. Let's just try that for a second and explain how that all works. So I want to know what is the integral between 0 and 2 pi of the cos of x dx. There's, there's my cos. Starts at 1, minus 1, 0 to 2 pi is the period. So the integral, or the antiderivative of cos x, of course, is sine x. So I'm going to be evaluating sine x between 0 and 2 pi. So that means I'm going to do the sine of 2 pi minus the sine of 0. And if you recall your sine function, quick sketch, that's 0 and 0, 
and I get zero. So I'm going to get zero area. And again, that's because this part and this part added together is the same as this part, but this part is all under. So this is positive, this is negative, and I'm subtracting them away from each other. So if you were to look at this and try to find a part that would give you a positive or negative area, you'd have to um, look at either between zero and, remember this is pi, this is pi over two. So I asked you, if I asked you between zero and pi over two, you would get a positive area. If I asked you between zero and two pi, then you would get zero again because these two would cancel out. If I did between pi, um, pi over two and three pi over two, then I would get this negative area down here. And you can try those if you want. Well, let's just do one of them. Let's say, what if I did the integral between zero and pi over two? So I just want this part right here of cos x dx. That's going to be equal to the sine of x between zero and pi over two. And that would give me the sine of pi over two minus the sine of zero and the sine of pi over two. Remember that was one. So I have one minus zero, so I would get one. Okay, so basically those are the, the rules that you might have to work with, um, which gives you a little bit of flexibility in your calculations. Okay, so let's go to some examples first. Let's find what is the definite integral between 0 and 5 of 2x dx. Now, don't forget your equal signs. I noticed in some of the other videos and some places, people forget those, and, and that's important when you're presenting your work. So if I want to know what the antiderivative of 2x is, I would add 1 to the exponent. That's 2 divided by 2, so I get x squared. Right, so it would x squared between 0 and 5. So that's going to be 5 squared minus 0 squared equals 25. Now, if you think about this, and let's just make a quick little sketch of what this actually looks like. The line 2x between 0 and 5 that's going to be twice the steepness. That would be like an X at 45 degrees. So it's going to be kind of very wiggly line. So if I went to 5, the height of this triangle, when X is 5, Y would be 2 times 5 or 10. So I would have um, a height of 10 here. I should probably have written this as 5 comma 10. So that gives me a height of 10 and a length of 5. So the area would be one half base times height. So a half of five times 10. And again, that gives me 25. So um, if you've been doing Raymond sums and making all those little triangles, remember you make the triangle smaller and smaller and smaller, especially on something like a curve. So if I wanted to find the area between uh, the curve and the x-axis here, you probably started by making all these little tiny triangles. Well, they're not triangles. They're, um, what do you call those things? Not rectangles. I can't think of the name right now, but I know you do because if you've done Raymond sums, you've already added all these together and approximated the area. And then it's just like when you had to do um, derivatives from first principles. You learn all the hard stuff and then say, oh, by the way, there are rules and you can find the derivative very easily. So instead of doing Raymond sums, you're going to be doing definite integrals. Okay, so let's try this one here. Another pretty simple one. It's a nice polynomial um, between one and six. So I'm going to take the antiderivative of 12x cubed. Remember to add 1 and divide by that number. So 3 plus 1 is 4. 12 divided by 4 is 3. So 3x to the fourth. And again, remember, you can double check by doing 4 times 3 is 12, reduced by 1, and I get 12x cubed. 
Um, for the next one, I add 1 makes 3. 9 divided by 3 is 3, and it is negative, minus 3x cubed. And this one is plus 2, and that's pretty easy. I get 2x, and I'm evaluating it between 1 and 6. Remember that you don't need the plus c because we would be subtracting it away here. Okay, so now it's just a matter of plugging in all your values. So I'm going to make a bracket here just to make sure that you keep all this nice and neat. 3x to the fourth, 3 times 6 cubed plus 2 times 6. And from that, I'm going to subtract. So that's f at b minus f at a. So I'm going to subtract 3 times 1 to the power 4 is just 3. And remember, if I'm plugging in 1, everything becomes 1. So minus 3 plus 2. This one's a little bit harder. You probably have to get out a calculator. 6 to the power 4. Where's my calculator? Hiding. It's hiding, but we'll bring it out. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to do 6 to the power 4 times 3. So I'm going to write all these out for you. So 3, 8, 8. 8, 6 to the power of 3 is 216, times 3 is minus 648, plus 12, and 3 minus 3 is 0, plus 2 is 2, and subtract 2. And if you do all that, I'm just going to tell you what I got. I got 3250. All right, we'll just double check it because I might have made a mistake. 648 plus 12 minus 2, and you'll get 3250. Okay, so the next one here, notice it's from 3 to 0. So you probably would guess that your answer should be negative. Um, sometimes good idea to go on to Desmos and plot this so you can see and approximate to see if it's the same as you might have guessed it might be. Okay, so let's do the antiderivative of these terms, I add 1 and divide by 5. That gives me 3w to the 5. Um, add 1 is 3, minus 13 divided by 3w cubed. Um, and I add 1, that gives me 2 divided by 2 is a half w squared. And that's being evaluated between 3 and 0. So I plug in the 0 first. I always start at the top. So 0, 0, 0. That was pretty easy. And I'm going to subtract. Now I plug in 3. So it's 3 times 3 to the power of 5 minus 13 over 3 times 3 cubed plus a half times 3 squared. So that's going to be 0, um, 3. This is like 3 to the power of 6. I'll do that quickly over on the side here. And I get 729. So I'm going to put it in brackets so I don't make a mistake. Um, 3, well, one of these 3s would make this a 2. That's 9. And 13 times 9 is uh, 117, I think. I'm going to double check that because sometimes yeah, it's 117. And this one, 3 squared is 9, so plus 9 halves. So in order for you to get a nice answer here, you're going to have to put everything over 2, right? You need you need half. So 729, 729 times 2 is 1458. I don't know why I put that. That's a minus. 1458, this is all going to be over 2. 117 would be minus 234 plus 9, all over 2. And you should get negative 12, 33 over 2. And there you have it. It's not all that hard, is it? Okay, but of course, some of the definite integrals have trickier little things in them, like this one here. So the first thing I would suggest, and these are z's here. I put a line to them. They're not twos with lines or anything like that. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is make this just a little bit easier to understand, right? I'm going to write it as the integral between 
one and two of, put a bracket. So I'm going to take the seven out one seventh times one over Z because I know the antiderivative of one over Z is the ln of Z, right? I'm not going to put it to the numerator, not that one. And I'm adding, so this is four in the denominator. So let's kind of make this a quarter and it's going to be Z to the power. Remember this is the exponent and this is your, um, uh, sorry, the, the part, the top of your numer your fraction, this is the bottom. So it's two thirds power. It'll be easier to work with. And minus one half. And the Z is in the denominator. I bring it to the numerator. That makes it negative. Okay, so I hope I'm not making you sound like this is all. I'm over explaining things, but sometimes you just forget things, right? Okay, so I want to take the antiderivative here. So this is going to be 1 over 7, and 1 over z is going to be the ln of z. Ln of z. And this, 1 over 4, I add 1 to this, so that's going to make it 5 over 3. I'm going to multiply by 3 over 5. That's going to give me plus 3 over 20 z to the uh, add 3, so to the 5 over 3. Now you can see quickly if I multiplied this by this by taking the derivative to check my answer, uh, 5 will go into 24 times and those 3's would cancel out. And the last one here, I'm going to add 1 to minus 3. Don't forget when you add to a negative, it becomes less negative. So that's going to be minus 2. So I'm dividing by minus 2. So that's going to give me a quarter here. Half times a half is a quarter z to the minus 2. So again, I would check minus 2 times this would be minus 2 quarters is a half. And reduce this by 1 would be to the negative 3. And that whole thing is going to be evaluated between 1 and 2. So now I have to plug in 2 first. So I have 1 over 7 ln 2 plus 3 over 20 times 2 to the 5 thirds plus 1 over... Okay, now we can fix this rate at once. This is 2 to the negative 2. 2 to the negative 2 is... 1 over 2 squared, that's 1 over 4 times 1 over 4, that's going to give me 1 over 16. Okay, so that's just the first part, right? Remember that um, you have to make sure that you do this and then minus that one, right? So right now I've got all this done and I'm going to subtract, um, subtract, and I'm going to plug in 1. So 1 over 7 ln of 1. What's the ln of 1? I'll let you think about that for a minute while we finish this. I plug in 1 here. 1 to any power is 1. So I'm going to be adding 3 over 20. And 1 here is just going to be 1 quarter. So do you remember what the ln of 1 is equal to? Ln 1 equals, in other words, if this would be, if you wrote that as log base e of 1, I'd say, what do I raise e to? What power do I raise e to to get 1? And your answer is 0. Okay, so that's going to be 0. And 3 twentieths plus 1 quarter, that would make 8 twentieths. So we have a little bit of fraction work left here to do. So, oh, just a minute, that looked like I wrote it as a Z. It's supposed to be a 2. It's probably when you work with Zs and numbers, right? Lawn 2 plus this. Oh, I don't know what the third root of 2 was raised to the fifth power, so I'm just going to leave it as 2 to the 5 thirds plus 1 over 16. And this, we had said this was going to be 8 over 20 because this is times 5 times 5, and 5 plus 3 is 8, plus 8 over 20. So the only part I'm going to just work with is this. What is the lowest common denominator of 16 and 20? That would be 80. So 
16 is 5 over 80. 1 over 16 equals 5 over 80. And 8 over 20 is the same. 8 over 20 is 32 over 80. Okay, so it's just on the side here. So I'm going to add those two together to get... Um, just a minute, I forgot a bracket here, didn't I? Ooh, Miss Havron. They should have been subtracting this 8 over 20. Because this was positive, 8 over 20, and minus it. So it should have been minus 8 over 20. So I have 5 over 80 minus 32 over 80. That's minus 27 over 80. And the rest of this. And that's the way I'm going to leave my answer. Unless your teacher asks you to write it as a decimal, in which case you would get out your trusty calculator and, you know, like find the cube root of 2, raise it to the power of 5, multiply by 3, divide by 20 for that one. You can find the ln of 2 easily, divide it by 7, and you can make this into a decimal as well. Okay, so that's um, a little introduction to definite integrals. If there's something more specific you need help with, just let me know. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, share, and uh, yeah, have a great day.